Um, so a little bit about us. Um, so we are essentially a data centralization platform and we are aimed at helping data literacy, AI adoption across businesses, etc. cetera. Um, that's not why I'm here today. I'm here to talk more about the sort of strategic landscape of implementation of AI. Um, I had about three days notice that I was gonna be doing this, so uh, that's always handy. But I am gonna make it interactive because I think you don't always come here just to hear me. You come to hear off each other, and I think that's part of the whole ethos of these events. So can you all just scan that QR code? It's completely confidential, anonymous, none of your personal information. It's just purely a way of being able to give feedback for the presentation, because I think it is important, and I will be referring to different aspects of this. Um, so one of the questions I've got right now is, what are the key goals for AI? And if you haven't managed to do it, it's menti.com and then use that code. But if, every, if you can put just a couple of keywords in there, I think it's really good to kind of get feedback because this is something that was always quite interesting to me. And I'm gonna to touch on it several times over, but AI is currently the answer before you've even got the question. And I think that is a big problem at the moment. Everybody just says, we need to do AI, we need to do AI. Um, but why do you need to do AI? And a lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is actually around the areas that are gonna make your AI journey easier and better, but also means you can get quick wins without even utilizing AI or spending time implementing it. So yeah, let's take some of these. So we've got insights, um, efficiency, enhancements, enablement, adoption, lots of goods. I'll share this out afterwards as well, by the way. So I think this is kind of a bit of a research piece for everybody to, to feed into. So please please do answer, which is great. Seeing lots of good answers. I think efficiency is standing out as probably the, the top answer here. Um, what about automation? Why, why, why can't you get that from, um, why can't you get efficiency from automation? So that's kind of the questions I like to ask the customers we work from. But I understand where AI drives it a step further, and that's some of the stuff. So. We are going to take it absolutely back to basics because some of the conversations we have, even with the top, top CIOs that you would expect to know this inside out, they do not. So the question, uh, so what is AI? Uh, there's different types. Um, we've got reactive, which is the kind of thing that Netflix does uh, where we limit uh, context. You've got Tesla uh, doing things like limited memory. So they're looking at the historic. They could have a bit more context in the AI to be able to make short term decisions. Theory of mind, so uh, replica are um, like human to human chatbots. Um, I think they got about 44% of their chatbots have been told I love you by a human, which is quite interesting. Um, then you've got um, OpenAI, which we obviously know, and the likes of Gemini and so many others. Um, and then the future, so AGI and ASI, luckily we're not quite there yet, because I don't think we're ready as a, as a human race, let alone anything else to be adopting those. So just a quick recap, and uh, NVIDIA describe it really well. What I'm gonna kind of touch on today really is generative AI, the, um, what it can do. So it's based on, as we know, a variety of inputs and you get a variety of outputs. Um, one cool one, so this is just an example that we actually use. So I've tried not to go too big on some of these examples, just cool little things that can be done with generative AI and around efficiency, as some people mentioned. So one of the things that we did, um, my marketing team kept telling me they were too busy, so I got one of the engineers to solve the problem, as probably re resonates with a lot of you. Um, so we got also asked to feed into our platform, which triggered an open AI call, which landed in Make. So I don't know if any of you have come across Make, but it's a very good modular-based uh, processing system. That then said, right, okay, well, this is the top story. We've, this is related to what Configure do. We're gonna use that to generate some output. It passed it into Word documents and it gave, the, it gave us about six or seven potential blog posts, which could then be vetted and, and, and shared. And really good to put your kind of workspace in. Um, however, there is some things around um, the implementation of generative AI that, that are a problem. And I won't say the airline specifically um, that fly out of Canada, but the, um, the, the chatbot that they implemented online um, it, it had started having hallucinations. So it was telling customers there was a very specific use case, and that use case was, what is your um, policy for, is that me? No. What is your policy um, for grievances? So if, if somebody's died in my family, can I get a refund on my flight? Um, it's, actually my, it's actually my laptop ringing, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So, and, and the, the chatbot said, yeah, we have, we have a bereavement policy. We can, we can offer discounts and refunds, buy the ticket, and we'll sort it afterwards. Um, the long and short of it was that wasn't their policy. They hadn't fine-tuned it. 
Um, it went to court and they tried to say that chatbot was a different entity to them. Didn't fly, as you'd imagine, um, to use the pun. And essentially, they uh, they got fined heavily. So it's, it is a cautionary thing. It's about taking the right steps to implement. So I've got a, a, quite another question here for you. Um, where are you currently on your AI strategy? Um, so is it 100% complete? Are you complete but constantly revising? Is it in progress, not started? Um, this will be quite interesting, I think, to see. OK, that's good. It's kind of it's kind of what I expected. I was hoping before anyone puts it up there, there was not going to be a complete and not revising option, which I think is uh, can sometimes be uh, it's quite telling. So, um, in terms of AI and strategy, uh, it's one of the things we advise quite a lot on. Um, I think for us, there's four key aspects to it. There's obviously a lot more, but there's four big ones, and the data governance is one. Um, it's about you know. Can you train it effectively? Is your data in a structure that's actually going to lead to consistent outputs from AI? That's one of the biggest challenges is getting consistency. Um, monitoring and evaluation. So how are you going to monitor AI going forward? You can't just slap generative AI on top of it and hope that it's going to work and leave it at that. What are the processes going to be for that? Um, coming back to my first point, which was around goal alignment, like why are you using AI in the first place? Is it something that can be addressed with something that you already have? Um, is, is, are you using AI in, in a particular way because it's cool and it's modern? And I'll come on to some warning stories about that shortly. Um, and then ethical considerations. And I don't mean necessarily, it's not always, um, are people going to lose their jobs? We've always had that long-term di dilemma, essentially, around automation and things. But actually, is the data that we're going to utilize fair? Uh, is it being biased in any way? And the problem, the big problem we have is that the growth of data on the internet um, essentially means that in three years' time, there'll probably be more generated AI content than there is actual content on the internet right now. So how do we manage that? Because if you're passing AI-generated content back into AI, who knows what's going to happen? So those are things to consider. Um, and I'm going to ask a couple, another question, actually. What is your biggest challenge of implementing AI? And if there's any others, um, there was meant to be another option, so I apologize. But, uh, but yeah, if there's any others, we can discuss later. But these are, I think, are the top five that we're that we're sort of coming across. So this will allow you to give a rating score of where you see the, the challenges. And I think this this will be quite interesting for everybody to sort of see if everyone aligns to yourselves or slightly differently. I mean, it is pretty even spread, I think. Um, as expected, infrastructure, we've, we've, we've all spent a lot of time building infrastructure for the automation processes, a lot of other things. So it is going to be lower on the list. Um, and, and that's really interesting. So I think it is more on the data side, which is which is great. So um, as part of my cautionary tale, I have a question. How does RPA currently fit into your businesses? You can select multiple because there's options to be still using it, but moving away, et cetera. It'd be interesting to see. I'm glad you're answering, by the way. There's always a massive risk when I did this that no one was going to put any answers in. It would look very embarrassing, but um, no, that's good. Okay, so yeah, we're getting some good feedback. So um, there's a massive split and divide on this. I, I, I've personally always seen RPA as a bit of a weird solution to a problem. And the reason is you are essentially emulating, in a lot of cases, bad process that was already taking place just in an automated fashion. Um, and I think we run the... I think, obviously, that doesn't go for everybody. A lot of people have done this well, but there's a lot of people now who are actively moving away because they've had issues where they've tried to emulate humans, it saves time, it saves a bum on a seat, but actually it leads to bad process. And, and instead, it should have just been, what is the process that we're trying to achieve? And I think we have the same situation with AI potentially that could occur if we're not careful. So I think we need to be really cautious to think about what is the AI process, is it just going to be AI to replace what someone is already doing, or can we optimize that process? And I think that is another key thing that we talk about on a regular, regular basis. So I wanted to highlight that because I was expecting a few people to be moving away, which they are, because AI is going to kind of replace that. And who knows where AI is going to go in the next two to three years. The next thing will come along. So we just want to make sure that we're automating that stuff. So there's, there's, there's kind of four big problems with, the, um, with AI. Um, utilizing data at the minute within your organizations. I think the first one is fragmentation of data. So having lots of silo data across the business, 
How do we centralize it? Because it's OK to use generative AI in pockets, for example. Um, but when we look at it as an organization, how do we make the best use of it? How big of our data lake's got to get? How do we optimize what we're trying to do? Those are the, the challenging questions. And I think I don't, have, I don't have all the answers for it. I have some of them based on some stuff we do. But I think it's really interesting because I think collectively as a, uh, as a group, we need to kind of share the ideas, the good stories, the things we're working on, which is going to be crucial. Um, data quality. So th this is one of the biggest problems um, inherently in every organization. Missing data, bad data, it's just going to completely skew what AI thinks the answer is to your questions or how it's going to be implemented. Uh, data literacy, and it kind of ties itself similarly to, to dark data. Um, people in the organization who can't use the systems or don't use systems well revert to spreadsheets, revert to processes outside of your mainstream. They are not feeding into what you're trying to achieve as an organization. And that's a big challenge and thing that needs to be overcome to be able to get that kind of high level governance. And I think there's, there's steps that can be taken there. And then dark data is an interesting one for me because everyone says, oh, 90% of organizations is dark data. They don't utilize it. But 90, probably 80% of that is because you don't need to. It doesn't give you anything useful. So I think it's a, it's a challenge because there is stuff um, held within your systems now that is useful. But it's also what AI really does help with is to help you extract that stuff out to understand what is useful before you even do anything with it. So I think that's one really good use for dark data um, thing to explore. So I just included a few good examples from customers of ours around things they're utilizing AI for. I think it gives a good, a good idea and premise. So, and it covers a really good topic. So um, Network Rail are doing root crime analysis. They're looking at on the tracks, there's suicides, there's trespass, there's theft. At the moment, um, they take data analysts' manual tagging of log, logged events. It's typed in, it could be radioed in. It's all manually tagged because you can have a level of automation where somebody tags it, but when they're in a rush and these are real incidents that are real people that could be harmed, they're going to be wrong. So they have to double check. So we brought in um, AI processes with them over an initial POC phase. And within um, six months, we essentially saved within one unit um, tw 12 days for two members of staff in, in terms of tagging. So there's three different types. You can have your predicted model, which says, yes, I am very confident that this is correct. You can have your recommended, which tags that up and says, yes, this is something I need you to flag, but here's what I think it is, which saves massive amounts of time. They don't have to trawl through all of the data. And then you have your manual where we just go, I have absolutely no idea what this person was on about. Go and have a look at it manually. Go and maybe have a look elsewhere. And that, that's quite interesting. But the big thing from this is the automation versus accuracy. And I think this is something that a lot of people forget. You can have full automation, no matter what, especially with AI, but it's not going to be very accurate. And it's trying to find that sweet spot. So you can see that we've sort of settled on this sort of 75% uh, confidence because it gives you that really good split of speed, but also um, interaction. So I think those are the kinds of things you just need to consider on your projects. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not here trying to pitch, oh, we can help you with this. This is ultimately just saying things to consider, think about the automation versus accuracy challenge and how you can potentially do that. Um, data centralization for Welsh government. So supply chain mapping, this is ultimately helping them understand and unleash the capabilities of the Welsh ecosystem. We're a Welsh company, so we absolutely wanted to help them with this. Um, but this is looking at, so for example, in COVID, um, they got loads of the distilleries to switch around, start building hand gel, making hand gel. It was, a, it was an easy switch. But there's now things like EV, um, offshore wind. There's lots of um, businesses that could form consortiums, could bid on the bigger projects that we don't have to offshore somewhere else. And I think that's a really key challenge is going, how do we identify them? What are the markers? What is, what is, how do we look at the demand? How do we look at the supply? And they're all things that can be done. So big thing around this was initial piece, regardless of any AI stuff that we're looking at, it was the centralization piece. And ultimately, they had very fragmented data in the organization. But having an underpinning financial database gave them that foundation. And I think, again, it's looking at what parts of your organization can build that central data pot is, is really key. Um, and then just to finish off, um, some data literacy and dark data um, challenges with like a, a Prostate Cymru, who is um, a, a charity we work quite closely with. They streamlined their processes by 80% by simply just having automation from the systems and integration. But then once it landed into the platform, their staff actually knew how to use something. And I think that's a big challenge. If you have this stuff land in spreadsheets, or we'll just export that into a spreadsheet and then pass that back in, they, they have 
the, the time it was taking them to double check things, mis, you know, mistyped formulas, um, things like that. Little things that you go, should that really impact a bit, like an organization of this size? Well, it does because it just trickles in everywhere else. And then dark data, they actually were collecting data from um, people who had had PSA tests and got diagnoses like two, three years down the line. They didn't do anything with it. So it's things like, well, hang on a second. If we look at three years ago, um, you know, when they had that test, what was their markers? What was their score? And all of a sudden, that all starts feeding into the ecosystem. That's unlocking a whole other thing. And they're not even, you know, essentially that they're not the NHS. They're a side charity. But if they can contribute to what their overall goal is, which is to reduce prostate cancer, then fantastic. So it's those kinds of side things that need to be thought about, which is uh, really interesting. And just a bit of the future in numbers. So um, 404 billion is the anticipated spend globally for AI in 27. So. As much as I keep saying to people, you know, make sure you've got a use case for AI, everyone is absolutely going to be jumping on the AI bandwagon, and rightly so, because it is fantastic. Um, but around 33 billion of that is anticipated for, for generative AI. And um, again, around the cautionary tale, the average data cost breach was 3.6 million last year. So when looking at the strategy, security is absolutely paramount in terms of how this is implemented. And um, I think one of the key things I haven't touched on, but generally is um, how is generative AI going to be rolled out across the organization. Tools like Copilot and stuff are fantastic. They're really, really good for, for what, it's, what it's there to do. But how do you stop someone using ChatGPT and giving out false information is kind of, yeah, when you have the answer to that, let me know because I'll pass it on to everyone else as well. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to happy to answer them. But hopefully that was, was useful and uh, yeah, not too high level. But uh, yeah. yeah.